Hello and welcome to the Grand Line Review, your source for everything One Piece, and today it's time to get into more very, very tantalizing unsolved mysteries, of which this incredible series has presented an absurd amount. And before we get into anything, I'd like to remind you all that this is the third part of a series of unsolved mysteries videos. Links to the first two will be in the description, but I bring that up because if your particular unsolved mystery of choice is not anywhere on this list, then chances are it will be in one of the other two. So don't come at me with bro, where's the One Piece? Because we've already covered that and many, many more. But we are still nowhere near done because there are an awful lot of unanswered questions in One Piece, and the criteria for this list is very simple. The topic in question must be mysterious and not have an official answer or explanation. I don't care what fan theories are out there, if it isn't in the series at the time of this recording, then it is irrelevant. But what isn't irrelevant though is this 10, counting 10 seconds to talk about Cartoonificami, a group that makes all sorts of fun caricatures, including One Piece bounty posters, which you can customize to your heart's content. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, the link for Cartoonificami is in the description below. And with that out of the way, let's begin. Welcome to another edition of the Top 5 Unsolved Mysteries in One Piece. Number 5. The Tequila Wolf Bridge. Kicking things off, we have one of the locations of the world that interests me the most, and one that has been very, very subtly developed in the background of the series. But what makes this place particularly mysterious is that we still do not know why it exists. I mean, yes, you can make the reasonable herp derp stance of saying, well, it's a bridge, so it probably exists to connect location A to location B. And I would guess that that is probably a very reasonable assumption, but where did it come from and where is it going? The first time we would encounter this bridge, it was said to be in East Blue, and most memorably, it was the place where Nico Robert was sent by the mighty powers of Bartholomew Kuma, where she was ever so briefly enslaved before being rescued by the Revolutionary Army. However, without going too deeply into spoilers, Tequila Wolf went on to make another brief appearance in the series in a recent flashback. However, the way the events were portrayed would suggest that despite the similarity in climate and structure, that this location was not in East Blue because it was plonked into a very Grand Line centric journey. So it does call into question not only why this bridge exists, but do multiple Tequila Wolves exist? And is it meant to be one stretch of bridge or is it going to be a series of bridges that come together and connect the entire world? Or well, this could have been just a weird storytelling decision by Oda, but it's interesting to know that this bridge has been under construction for at least 700 years. So this thing must be intended to truly revolutionize the world or perhaps it was intended to do so all those centuries ago. In any case, it is a mammoth endeavor by the world government and by this time, it had become so large that it was considered a nation of its own. And as for its overall purpose, well, to be honest, we may not even find out in the lifespan of this series, as it would appear that it still may require centuries of work to complete. Unfortunate, but I guess that's just the nature of mysteries. Number four. The Eternal Daylight of Any Slobby. So next up is a mystery that I feel is quite often forgotten about by the fan base at large, primarily due to the exceptionally dramatic events taking place at the time. But in the background of all of this declaration of war on the world government, rescue Robin and Cypher Paul shenaniganry, is the fact that the sun never sets upon the judicial island of Any Slobby. So already from a practical perspective, I feel awfully sorry for anybody who has to live on Any Slobby because that should completely wreck their internal body clocks. And you'd really need a very dedicated dark space to not be driven absolutely insane but from a thematic standpoint, it's easy to see why the world government may have chosen this location because justice does not rest. And so this island is always active. And in terms of the real world, we do have places that are comparable. Do this the closer you get to the poles, but there is no place in the world where the sun literally never sets at some point during the year, and it always has various degrees of daylight. Whereas any slobby is a very simple, consistent afternoon fun time at all times. And in order to achieve such a thing, I imagine that the One Piece world would need to have at least two suns that can overlap and keep any slobby at a consistent level of daylight. However, because this is One Piece, there are certainly other potential explanations, one of which I have mentioned before in a couple of previous videos, being that maybe any slobby is the result of an awakened use of the Pika Pika no Mi, thus changing the climate into a permanent lightscape. But interestingly enough, the whole daylight business is not the only mystery of any slobby, because the island is also situated above some sort of infinitely deep hole in the world, resulting in a terrifyingly beautiful waterfall. But the question remains, what caused this incredible phenomena? Was it an ancient weapon like Pluton or what? There are so many curiosities in regards to any slobby that it's almost a shame that it was completely obliterated by a buster call, but I will remain ever intrigued to find out more about this specific location of the world. Number three. Dr. Vegapunk. Now this isn't any sort of specific unsolved mystery, but more of an air of mystique surrounding one of the very few great figures in this world that have yet to be revealed to us. And this is despite the fact that Vegapunk has had such a profound impact on the events of One Piece as we know it, pretty directly through his crazy innovations. The most well known of which would be the Pacifista, the super advanced cyborg powerhouses that are based on the image of Bartholomew Kuma. But Vegapunk's research also extends down to comparatively low level discoveries, such as how to imbue an object with the powers of a Zoan type devil fruit. And that one 
hasn't manifested itself as a core story element, but it has influenced characters like Lasso and Funkfried, who make up some nice depth and richness in their respective arcs, and it's all directly from Dr. Vegapunk. Furthermore, he is thus far the only person to have crafted a seemingly passable artificial devil fruit, although Vegapunk himself allegedly considers it to be a failure. A fruit that would go on to be consumed by Momonosuke, but then even more terrifyingly, Fujitora has hinted at a new Vegapunk development that has the potential to reshape the entire world. And with that in mind, one of the more intriguing things to think about is exactly where Vegapunk stands on an ideological spectrum. Given that he is the chief scientist of the world government, it's easy to view him as an antagonist. However, it may not necessarily be that simple because he did grant Kuma's final wish to assist the Straw Hats, and he has been referred to as a genuinely kind individual who cared very much for the people of his home on Karakuri Island. So it's really hard to see where such a theoretically honorable, I guess, guy who carries a large degree of empathy fits into the world government structure, as he is, in effect, allowing them to retain their dominance of the world. Although perhaps that's just his personal sense of justice, or maybe justice doesn't play into it at all. Perhaps he's just a quirky scientist constantly in search of ideal research conditions and resources. Who knows? Although hopefully, I guess, eventually we know one day. One day, hopefully soon. Number two, the giant straw hat. So I don't know about anyone else, but when I first saw this appear in the manga, I was fairly convinced that I was either asleep or just daydreaming, or perhaps engaged in some other activity where your mind goes and does something so strange and surrealist, because it was just such a bizarre turn for One Piece to take, to all of a sudden introduce the idea that there is a hell of a lot more importance to the general concept of the straw hat than initially thought. I mean, an heirloom of Roger and Shanks is one thing, but a mysterious giant replica kept sealed deep within the vaults of the world's most powerful organization certainly does craft an entirely new question mark and has me thinking far more intently about straw hats than I ever would have in my life otherwise. And it obviously brings up the thought of who exactly did this belong to? And naturally you'd suspect it would have to be worn by some sort of giant, which is not a huge stretch because the will of D is not especially picky on what kind of race you are. And we do have at least one giant in the series with this initial being Jaguar D. Sol, although there are definitely more because he also mentioned that everyone in his family also had that initial. So rather simply, perhaps straw hats were just the fashion of the ancient kingdom. And this one was worn by a particularly prominent giant figure who you know, I guess could be Joy Boy, or perhaps this is just too vague a mystery to deal with at the moment. All we can really gauge from it is that Luffy's straw hat is a symbol of significantly more importance than Roger's will and Shanks' promise, becoming yet another feature that directly ties Luffy into being an incredibly fated figure in this world, potentially carrying the weight of an entire ancient kingdom upon his head. Whatever the case, the straw hat business seems to be old enough that it has long since been forgotten about by the world, with the exception of one figure, which, you know, rather conveniently brings us to Number one, Eam. So if there was one thing that shocked me more during the Reverie arc than a random giant straw hat out of, you know, nowhere, it was the revelation that there is a soul power governing this world, even above that of the five elder stars. What Eam represents is absolute authority, but in a most sinister manner, which is first of all aesthetically cute to us through his shadowy figure and powerful eyeball thing. But the thing that scares me more about this figure is that they are being deliberately kept hidden from the world, even those closest to the reins of power, because allied kings and royalty know nothing of this supreme being, and it's arguable over for whether or not the world nobles on mass are aware of Eames' existence either. Although to be fair, they're also distracted with their selfish pursuits that they probably wouldn't even notice a hell of a lot going on right under their noses. But for a single presence to have complete command of the five elder stars, it is undeniable that Eames is the most powerful figure in this world. And once again, that is through sheer authority alone. He can command the world's greatest military power, the vast majority of the planet's currency, as well as its infrastructure, and as a result, can pull any lever he so wishes to achieve a desired outcome, which has us on the edge of our seats in regards to those that he seems to have taken an interest in, being Monkey D. Luffy, Marshall D. Teach, Princess Shirohoshi, and of course, Nefertari Vivi. And all of this puts Eam in a prime position to be one of, if not the final antagonist of the series. Potentially, anyway, I still personally think it's going to be Blackbeard, but I've done a whole video on that. But in any case, Eam is undoubtedly the ultimate being to topple in order to truly revolutionize the world and break the shackles of the world government for good. All of that currently wrapped in a neat little mysterious package, which hopefully will be opened in the near future. But that pretty much does it for yet another edition of the top five unsolved mysteries in One Piece. If you enjoyed this video and the content this channel produces in general, then please do consider donating to the Grand Line Review Patreon because the support of all of you amazing people is what continues to make this channel possible. And if you'd like to see more videos like this but applied to other anime among series, then please do check out my second channel, New World Review, for all of your wider needs. And if you'd like to join the fun at any time, then please do head over to my Discord server where a wide array of shenanigans takes place on a daily basis. And finally, please do comment with your own favorite unsolved mysteries in the series. This has been the Grand Line Review, and I'll see you next time.
Do you think Luffy will ever become the most powerful character in the series, like most main characters in anime? So no, I do not, or at least I guess I certainly hope not. And to be honest, it really weirds me out when I hear people say, yes, of course Luffy is going to be the most powerful, because that's the only possible way he's going to become the Pirate King, because it's just not true. And I think that the last few arcs have really solidified that Luffy's core strength does not actually lie in his physical abilities, but more so in his charisma and sense of fate. I believe that Luffy is going to become the Pirate King because he is going to attract the right allies to assist him in getting there, and that acts as stark contrast to figures like Big Mom and Kaido, who are massive powerhouses on their own, but just don't quite have what it takes to become the Pirate King in the end. And so I don't think that Luffy will ever be as strong as the truly top tier combatants of this world, but that doesn't mean that he will not defeat them. And Wano is going to be the ultimate example of that. No matter which way you look at it, Luffy cannot beat Kaido through brute force or crazy battle tactics. Something else is going to need to happen to secure his victory here and further carve his path to becoming the Pirate King.